to welcome all of you who are here in our in-person audience, but also everyone who is joining us on Zoom. Um, and just so all of you know, we are recording today, and this classroom picks up a lot of ambient noise. So just know if you're if you think you're whispering something to a neighbor, it's probably being recorded. Uh -oh. <laughs> so just you know, so we're on the up and up about things. But uh, my name is Kate DeConnick. I'm the director of the Cohen Center here at Keene State College. And we are thrilled to be hosting today's Cohen conversation on the topic of classroom censorship in New Hampshire. And this event is in partnership with the ACLU of New Hampshire, as well as the Keene State College Office of Justice, Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion. So we're not going to do super extensive introductions today, but I did want to tell you just a little bit about the format for our conversation. Um, Jill, who's our speaker today, is going to give a little bit of an intro, so probably about 20 or 30 minutes, is that what we were thinking? Just to kind of give you all some basics about the case that he was part of, so we have some common ground for conversation. Um, after that, we'll have about 30 minutes or so for questions and conversation. Um, we will also take questions from our webinar attendees through the Q&A function, so if you're joining us via Zoom, you can type in questions and we'll try and pose those to our guests for today as well. And for everybody, um, just a reminder to please keep your questions and remarks concise and respectful so that we can hear from as many people as would like to be part of the conversation. So we thank you in advance for that. And before we start, I also wanna thank Michelle Kiawa from the Cohen Center who arranged all of the logistics and the catering for today's event. So all of you in person having this lovely meal, you can thank Michelle. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I also wanna thank Debbie Bowie, where are you Debbie? Oh, hiding right in front of me, right? Um, Debbie was the one who first connected me with Jill, as well as Paul, who's the director of philanthropy at the ACLU of New Hampshire. These were great partners in kind of bringing this event to life. So thank you both very much. And then also just a huge amount of gratitude to Dr. Dottie Morris, who, who's with us in the front row. Um, she's not only our vice president for justice, equity, diversion, and inclusion at Keene State College, but also the chair of the board of directors for the ACLU of New Hampshire. So we're lucky to have so many wonderful partners who've helped to bring today's event to life. Um, and Dottie, I think I'm gonna introduce my, our speaker and then I'll turn it over to you. Okay, perfect. So Gilles Bissonnette is the legal director at the ACLU of New Hampshire, where he leads a team of three civil rights lawyers. He has litigated cases on racial justice, the criminalization of poverty, voting, police and government accountability, public records, the First Amendment, immigrant rights, and criminal justice issues. And I'm sure that's only a partial list, right? <laughs> um, but Jill has testified before the New Hampshire legislator on more than 100 bills impacting civil liberties. And he has authored approximately 30 op-eds and other publications discussing civil liberties and civil rights issues. He's been with the ACLU since 2013. And Jill, we're delighted to be hosting you for today's conversation. I'm gonna turn it over to Dottie first and then we'll turn it over to you. So thank you so much. Um, and I'm also just gonna send around one more time our sign-in sheet for today. If you're in person, please make sure you just check off your name or add your name to our list if you wouldn't mind. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. <laughs> um, get them get them going, get them going. <laughs> yeah um, uh, on behalf of uh, president treadwell she asked me to welcome everyone here today uh, she was unable to attend uh, i think what we will be talking about today um is such an important a uh, piece of work that we need to continue to engage in regardless of how what the outcome will be in the current case, because I think that there are more and more uh, opportunities uh, based on some legislation that's coming through and down the pike that could possibly have an impact on uh, silencing or erasing or, or an attempt to erase uh, some of our history and the capacity to pass that history and understanding of that history on to young people. So uh, I think that we have a lot of students here, so I appreciate that. And I, I know we will have a great conversation. So I'll turn it over to you. Well, thank you, Kate. Thank you, Dottie, so much for that just warm introduction. It is such a pleasure to be speaking here, uh, really for the first time, uh, especially in conjunction with the Cohen Center, whose work is really incredible uh, throughout the state. And there are some connections, I think, between 
the Cohen Center's mission and some of the very real issues uh, that are confronted in this lawsuit that I, I as we've discussed, really want to make explicit here. Um, I want to start uh, with uh, a Martin Luther King quote. It's not the one we all tend to hear about, the 1964, you know, or the, the March on Washington, 1963-64 speech, but it's something a little different. He wrote in 1967 that whites, it must frankly be said, are not putting in a mass effort to re-educate themselves out of their racial ignorance. He added that it is an aspect of their sense of superiority that the white people of America believe that they had so little to learn. And he said that same year in an interview that the concept of supremacy is so embedded in the white society that it will take many years uh, to, uh, for color to cease being a judgmental factor. Under New Hampshire's classroom censorship law that was enacted in uh, uh, 2021, these words can only be taught in New Hampshire public schools and in trainings of public employees as an outdated historical relic with no application to either present day society or to students real life personal experiences and any educator or public employee with the temerity to suggest otherwise risks investigation, public condemnation and professional ruling. That is what we are talking about with classroom censorship, not only in New Hampshire, but throughout the United States. New Hampshire is one of 18 states with a classroom censorship law. We all remember late 2020, the hotly contested election between President Trump and now President Joe Biden. And if you all don't remember on, on September, uh, as uh, that election was really heating up of that year, an anti-critical race theory executive order was put out by the president saying federal contractors and federal places of employment, really all federal agencies for that matter, uh, it generally can't talk about race in their work. And it was devastating. I want to just be clear what that uh, executive order was all about. That executive order came out in September of 2021. And a memo promulgated just a few days after that executive order said, in trying to assess what training is covered under this executive order, you should look for phrases like systemic racism. You should look for phrases like white privilege. You should look for phrases like implicit bias. All of these things were targeted by that then presidential administration for censorship in federal places of employment. Now we all know what happened in the 2020 election. We have a, a new president. That day, January 20th, 2021, the president rescinds that executive order. So we all know what happened next. <clears throat> that executive order became a template throughout the entire United States to ban those same discussions now in public school under the notion, we all know the three letter word that, that got thrown about for what this is trying to cover, right? Critical race theory. Whatever that means, right? <laughs> and it was a pretty effective strategy. New Hampshire, and I think this is a real sad commentary on this state, was among the first to actually consider these types of laws, to take portions of that Trump executive order and embed it in state law and say, you cannot talk about these things in our public schools. Incidentally, private schools, that's fine. It's private schools that are receiving public funds through vouchers, but we'll set those aside. <laughs> but in public schools, um, you can't talk about these particular issues. And it immediately started having a devastating effect. Now I'll give just a, a bit quick highlight of just how it actually became law in New Hampshire. A cut and paste job of that executive order was initially promulgated in the House of Representatives. There was significant pushback. 
Um, and the House actually made this one of the House Republicans. Let's be able to say we got to say it right. But we're very explicit that this is one of our high priorities that we need this type of classroom censorship law in the state of New Hampshire. And it got to the point where they decided that we are actually going to hijack the budget process and make this a condition of the budget passing. So this wasn't a side off issue. It was a priority to fundamentally change New Hampshire schools and how they can talk about race, gender, gender identity, sexual orientation, and so forth. And let's all not remember or forget, I should say, the historical context here. May of 2020, George Floyd's murder. Racial justice protests, uh, you know, spread throughout the entire United States, including in New Hampshire. One of the largest protests happened in my hometown, Concord. Around 2,000 individuals protested. What Trump's executive order was about in what the classroom censorship restrictions that then followed throughout the country are about are a rejection of everything that those racial justice advocates were pushing for and advocating in support for. It is a, this is the backlash, folks, that we're dealing with. When you look at all of this in historical context. So the New Hampshire legislature has this inserted in the budget. The Senate ultimately makes some revisions to this particular legislation in ways that I don't think really fundamentally changed its flaws and in fact made it worse in some ways. It becomes part of the budget and the governor signs it and this becomes law in June, 2021. And it proceeded to immediately have a direct impact on our classrooms. Now you're gonna hear, or you probably have heard if you're aware of the commentary behind this particular legislation. It's just an anti-discrimination law. <laughs> uh, how we'll get into that a bit. Um, you know, it's not really having a huge effect Talk to any educator, all right? They'll tell you it's having a huge effect. Let's listen to the stakeholders who are actually trying to educate our students about race, about gender identity, about sexual orientation. And they will tell you exactly what we all know, which is that they cannot do their jobs with this law in effect. And so many people stepped up and said, we need to do something about this. Now, there are continued efforts to try to repeal that legislation, which is vitally important. And there uh, are, are the same coalition of individuals elected to bring a lawsuit challenging this statute in federal court. And we're proud to be part of that coalition. And the lead plaintiffs are, frankly, personal heroes of mine, Andres Mejia, uh, who is uh, a DEI educator in Exeter, and Christina Kim Philibot, who is the chief equity officer in Manchester School District the largest and most diverse school district in the state of New Hampshire. For that. And they came to me and said, we can't do our work. We can't give all students, but especially students from historically community, historically marginalized communities and identities, we can't give them the instruction that they need. We can't assign the books that they need so they can see themselves in those books. We can't do that under this law. And in fact, teachers are pulling back out of a fear of being uh, charged under this law. And that gets to the fundamental legal problem with this, in addition to all the policy problems with this that we've articulated. This is an ambiguous law. No one knows what it means at all. And when you have ambiguous restrictions and you combine them with penalties for violations. In this instance, the potential for even losing your license as an educator. It is a recipe for self-censorship and chill. Educators naturally, and it is human nature, to pull back. I'm not gonna assign that book. I'm not gonna engage in that discussion about race. Not just race as a historical issue, but how those historical concepts relate to today. So you can meet your students where they are. And that's what educators uh, uh, were saying quite forcefully. And that is the basis of the lawsuit that has been brought. Um, it's a broad coalition of individuals, I should say. It's not only uh, uh, Christina Kim Philibot and Andres Mejia, but you also have 
uh, the two largest teachers unions in the state, as well as some other uh, parents um, uh, as well bringing the lawsuit. So broad group of individuals who brought this case that occurred in December of 2021, that lawsuit was brought. There was motions filed to try to dismiss it. The federal judge in that case said, I'm not gonna dismiss the lawsuit because the statute as plausibly alleged seems pretty vague. We were asked to then build a record um, establishing that vagueness, which we think we did. We filed a new set of briefs and then we had oral argument the day after Martin Luther King Day. Uh, I don't know if that was planned or not, but I didn't tell the court that, but I thought it in my head, wow, this is, this is important timing, I think. Um, we had arguments on January 16th and now we're awaiting uh, a ruling. I want to talk a little bit more, though, about just what's going on from a national context as well. And, and this is this whole critical race theory issue is just an amazing piece of marketing, I think, to some extent as well. Um, deflection and dodging, can, you know, and, and using the ambiguity of that very term and exploiting that ambiguity to scare parents, scare teachers about what is and is not being taught in classrooms. I do want to read one, one of the individuals, I should say, who, who really was pushing these laws nationally is a gentleman by the name of Chris Rufo, used to work at the Heritage Foundation. Incidentally, actually testified at the New Hampshire legislature in support of the House version uh, of this law. So again, this is not a New Hampshire law, okay? This is a national movement that made its way to New Hampshire and got traction. Here's one of the things Mr. Rufo said about what he's doing. Quote, we have successfully frozen their brand, mm -hmm. critical race theory, into the public conversation and are steadily driving up negative perceptions. We will eventually turn it toxic mm -hmm. as we put all of the various cultural insanities mm -hmm. under that brand category. The goal is to have the public read something crazy in the newspaper and immediately think, critical race theory. We have decodified the term and will recodify to annex the entire range of cultural constructions that are unpopular with Americans. Did he, was, was he successful? Mm -hmm. This are. law is part of that New Hampshire strategy and was successful in New Hampshire. Um, and that is, I think, what underlies the fundamental problems with these laws. No one knows what critical race theory means. No one knows what the statute means. And so anything related to race, any type of instruction that meets certain students where they are, whether it's respect to race, gender identity, sexual orientation, whatever, is now kind of given these little code words, these branding terms that then people kind of wield around and suggest, no, you can't teach that in schools. And even the threat of an accusation Mm -hmm. Apart from filing a formal complaint is enough for teachers to pull back, and it is only human nature, and that is the danger. <laughs> Who loses under the system? It's students, right? I mean, teachers are bringing this lawsuit, educators are bringing this lawsuit, but it is students that lose out when teachers self-censor. Students are the reason why teachers show up every day and why they joined the profession. They are doing this work for them. And schools are places where teachers are required to develop personal relevance with the course material for each and every student. And in so doing, connect the then to the now. But the problem again with this law is the ambiguity of the law makes the ability of these teachers to make that connection virtually impossible. That MLK quote that I read to you from 1967. How do you talk about that quote in the face of the racism that fueled the Buffalo shooting two years ago? How do you do it? How do you have a classroom debate about affirmative action, especially as the US Supreme Court recently concluded its unconstitutionality, but where Justice Sotomayor talked about the deep problems uh, with uh, uh, adopting a colorblindness as a constitutional theory and how it actually further stigmatizes and marginalizes historically uh, uh, 
marginalized communities and identities. How do you even have that conversation to talk about a Supreme Court case after this statute? How do you talk about the civil rights movement and whether it was successful today in the face of the Charlottesville 2017 protests? I don't think you can have these conversations or at the very least, the law is so vague that, that teachers do not know. And again, they pull back, which we have seen repeatedly. Now I was asked in this lawsuit to build a record demonstrating the law's chill and we did that in the case and presented it to the court. And I think it's important in this discussion to have concrete examples. Because this isn't a law school exam problem, this issue. It deals with a law that, has, that continues to have real consequences. Books are quietly being shelved that were planned for instruction. So this is even like more insidious, right, like than a book ban. I don't want that book, I don't want that book, take it off your shelves. This law is so much more clever than that because it scares you to do that, to do that censoring yourself as an educator. And it has happened. Texts like Tiffany Jewell's 2020 book, this book is anti-racist, and Jason Reynolds and Dr. Kennedy's 2020 book for uh, individuals 12 and older, stamped, have been removed from instruction. They were gonna be part of educating students about these issues. And in fact, I would encourage people to read these books in their entirety. When you read this book is anti-racist, a book by author of color, it is not designed as an empowering text for middle students, middle school students, uh, middle school students trying to like figure out like what's my role in the world? I see this injustice, what, what can I do about it? It is an empowering book. This book was cited by the Department of Education Commissioner as a book that showed why this law was necessary. <laughs> What's wrong with this book? Nothing is wrong with this book. Teachers should feel comfortable reading it and presenting it to their students. But instead, the commissioner read this, in fact, one chapter of this book, to the State Board of Education, explaining this is why we need this law. The 2020 version of Stamped was approved by uh, at least one school board for eighth graders only to never come off the shelf following uh, public statements by the commissioner concerning Dr. Kennedy. This book, Fold. A book that leads with the following quote. To know the past is to know the present. To know the present is to know yourself. I write about the history of racism to understand racism today. I want to understand racism today to understand how is it affecting me today. I want you to understand racism today to understand how is it, how it is affecting you in America today. A book that teachers are afraid to present to our students. Other, educa other educators have curtailed their classroom destruction, uh, instructions. Mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, Christina Kim Philibot, one of our clients, because of the amendments, has recommended that teachers change the way they teach Jewel Parker Rhodes' 2018 book, Ghost Boys, which is an amazing book that people should read that has to do with a boy of color who is shot by police and how he comes back as a ghost. There is a scene in that book where there is a, a courtroom trial and there is discussion of implicit bias. Something we know was targeted by the Trump executive order that this law was modeled after. Can you talk about that now? Grave concerns about doing so. So this is where we are. And I think it's scary. I think we should all be scared. Our students need to be able to be given not only an accurate portrayal of history, the good, the bad, and everything that's in between, but how students learn history. Well, we all, you know, who's who are students here? How many students do we have here? I mean, do you, I, you know, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm an old person now, or older person, I should say, <laughs> and you know, I just remember thinking about history, you know, and and was just not motivated and energized when it's just dates and events. I needed those historical events to relate to me so I could understand truly what happened then and how society may or may not have been affected by the historical events. 
And I and again, I think the, the real concern is that that connection now cannot be made. So we filed this lawsuit. We're awaiting the decision. I think we're all cautiously optimistic, but we'll just have to see. I don't, I never count my chickens uh, in this business. Um, I hope we prevail. And as I think our clients have said, we need to prevail here. If we can't win at the legislature, if we can't get this repealed, um, we need to win in the courts. Our students are counting on us. Now, I did promise to make a connection. I'm looking for my notes here. A connection between this law and directly what the Cohen Center does, the amazing work that it's doing. We have a statute in New Hampshire, it's RSA 189 colon 11 IJ, and it actually requires, it's an amazing statute, it actually requires that our students be taught about anti-Semitism, national, ethnic, racial, or religious hatred and discrimination, as well as how to present, how to prevent the evolution of such practices, how to prevent genocide, folks, right? We can't relive as a society all the things uh, that, that we experienced, particularly, you know, uh, with respect to uh, the, the serious genocide and the Holocaust that affected Jewish individuals in Europe. What this law says is you need to not just study the history of genocide and anti-Semitism, but again, how to connect it to today, how to prevent it today. We all know we are seeing it today in horrible numbers. The amounts of anti-Semitism uh, and, and discrimination comments, the whole like, uh, we are in a tough place, folks. So it's, but it's part of our school curriculum to actually explain how to prevent that. Now the court said the classroom censorship law conflicts with that statute. How do you, how do you talk about preventing the evolution of genocide, preventing the evolution of anti-Semitism in 2024 without talking about discrimination today, the prejudices that people have today? You can't. And the court understood that and saw that conflict and explained this is one of the reasons why this law is so problematic. Here's what the court said. Beyond teaching the historical existence of Jim Crow laws, teachers are supposed to discuss their evolution and how such practices can be prevented under this statute, this anti-discrimination statute. In this context, it is not difficult to imagine that a discussion of remedies for past discrimination, such as reparations, would take place, which, which could subject a teacher to sanctions for teaching a banned concept. As a result, teachers could, in plaintiff's words, be left with an impermissible Hobson's choice, shirking their responsibilities under 189.11, that statute I just referenced. This is even more reason to require clarity in the amendments. Teachers should not be put in a position where they must instruct students on certain concepts, but face the threat of job loss if their instruction unintentionally and only by implication crosses the line into the classroom censorship law. How do you do both as an educator? How do you comply with your obligation to teach about anti-Semitism and religious hatred and discrimination, how to prevent those practices and comply with this law? You cannot do it. And again, who loses out? It is the students. And I just want to thank, I don't know if I'm over time, <laughs> but um, I just want to thank everyone so much for coming here today. And it's just a wonderful turnout. And uh, I'm excited about the conversation that we're hopefully going to have over the next half an hour, because it's an important one. And I think we all need to recognize, too, that the very conversation that we feel like we can have here, you know, the free flowing nature of just talking about racism, how it impacts uh, modern society. This is the very type of conversation that we cannot have now, essentially, or there's questions about whether we can have it in a high school class for 12th graders. So, um, you know, that's something that I'm very mindful of when I talk about these things, because I'm not sure I can have this conversation if, you know, I was in Central High School in Manchester. So, um, but with that, I'm happy to, to help facilitate this discussion or answer questions, but I'm just so honored and it's a privilege to be here today. Thank you all so much. <laughs> Thank you.
So Jill, I'm going to chime in. We have a couple of questions in the chat, and we can also take questions from our in-person audience. So if there's someone here who wants to kick things off, we can start with this group. And if not, I'll just kind of weave in some questions from the chat. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, well, thank you very much for your uh, inspiring presentation. Um, as I understand it, the present New Hampshire law is being attacked because it's vague and the teachers can't really know from reading the statute what they can and can't do. But suppose the law were not vague. Suppose the legislature uh, said explicitly and without any ambiguity, we do not want our students being taught about present racism in our society because we think whatever their reason might be, make them feel uncomfortable or it's divisive. Um, but they got away from the vagueness problem yep. and were explicit about uh, the uh, impermissibility of teaching a specific concept. For example, yep. uh, racial the statistics in our criminal justice system or anything else. What would the uh, legal situation be with respect to such a statute? Yeah, so that's a great question. To be very clear, um, there are kind of two claims that are being brought in uh, this litigation. The first is a due process vagueness challenge with the idea that we all know like due process, your life, liberty, property cannot be taken from you without due process of law. And part of that is in a law that allows your, your uh, job to be taken away from you, there needs to be clarity in the statute. That is the kind of fundamental notion of due process. Educators need to know where the line is. The second theory, though, um, is a, a free speech First Amendment claim uh, as well. And I think that gets right to your question, which is there is a, a, a case called the PICO case, which talks about like the right to information, right? Um, and I would be profoundly concerned under the First Amendment if even if the law was clear, <laughs> assuming the law was clear, with a curriculum restriction that said, you know, we just can't talk about race, period. We can't talk about gender identity, period. That would be clearer. But also just as devastating, right, for our students um, in, in public schools throughout the state of New Hampshire. So I think there you would even have a stronger First Amendment argument that there is a First Amendment right to access information that is being taken away from you. Now, I just... You know, without people getting um, over optimistic about that claim, I think it's a strong claim, but it is predicated on a plurality Supreme Court decision, not a majority Supreme Court decision called the PICO case. So folks should feel free to, to, to look it up, but it did not have five votes. It had four votes. And there have been some questions by some commentators about the legal footing that that First Amendment right to information is kind of based, is predicated on. And we might, as these attacks grow, we might end up seeing more litigation defining the contours of that right. Because I got to tell you, we we know a lot of these subjects, folks want to go after it in schools. Robert, um, actually, this kind of segues right, right off, off of your comment. So I'm the director of the library here. I've been a librarian for over 30 years. And so we, um, you know, libraries, particularly academic libraries, but all libraries really have moved away from describing ourselves as being neutral because libraries have never yeah. really been neutral. Yeah. We just describe ourselves that way. Yeah. Um, and I, but I'm thinking a lot about higher education because I'm sure you know, um, just last week, the house in Concord, um, we hope, sort of put the death knell to a bill that would have extended into higher ed um, and allowed for challenging and removing materials based on you know, very strange accusations of um, being offensive, being pornographic. If you read the newspapers, you'll know, um, I can't remember who it was, who decided to stand up and read, I don't know how much of, of a chapter. Uh, but I am also um, a follower of Mr. Rufo because I have connections to New College or what used to be New College in Florida. And um, those folks clearly have uh, plans um, to, to do the same kind of thing in higher education. And they are achieving some success, not just in Florida, but in other places. And so I think it's 
really smart for all of us who are sitting mm -hmm. here to pay a lot of attention to what's happening in, in the K through 12 public schools because it is coming for us. Mm -hmm. How much time you got on that? <laughs> so the bill um, that you're referencing, HB 1419, there's also a Senate version. I might, this might be wrong. I think it's SB 523. Someone might need to fact check me. So the, the critical race theory craze is, you know, died down, I guess, you know, so they're moving on to other things. And what, what, what are those other things? We're now like so in book ban land, right, folks? I mean, I, it's sex and sexual. I, I you know, I, I took this job in 2013, and one of my first public events was um, uh, it was book ban week, and I went to the Exeter bookstore and we gave a presentation. And you know, book banning is bad, but at the time, I'm like, you know, I got other things that are kind of more of a priority, and I kind of thought this was like a little hokey of a thing. It's we are living it, folks. Like uh -huh. this is what's going on right now. HB 1419 removes the protections for higher educational institutions that exist in our obscenity laws mm -hmm. designed to make higher education vulnerable mm -hmm. under our criminal obscenity laws. And it's packaged with a series of provisions that give the state board of education mm -hmm. uh, contr uh, ultimate final decision-making control over whether books can be removed or should be removed in local school districts. So traditionally, what, when we think about what's harmful to minors, we think about community standards. These are local decisions that should be made by our local elected officials who are accountable at the polling place to us. What this is designed to do is ultimately put that in the hands of the DOE. That is not elected by local community members. That is, doesn't necessarily know what the community standards are in the community that's having to decide whether or not a book is educationally suitable or not. Now, great news, this bill was indefinitely postponed, but we are, this is going to keep coming, coming and coming, coming, and it is not over because there's a nearly identical Senate bill that almost does the exact same thing. So uh, again, someone's going to have to check me on. I think it's 523. So this is, we talk about next steps. How do we fight against this? You talk to your legislature. You make your voice heard. This isn't, these aren't issues for the State Board of Education. These are issues for our local community members as to what books are educationally suitable or not in libraries. No one's saying that books that are educationally unsuitable should be in libraries. That's not what people are saying. But there need to be clear standards delineated that aren't ambiguous. And ultimately, it is my local officials that ultimately make that call at the end of the day, not people from Congress. So, why, why are, why is this law? Why was the law passed? The big, the big picture. Yeah. What, what are the, what are the uh, proponents of this bill that is now law <clears throat> trying to do? Well, I, I. I can tell you what they said, and I can tell you what I think is really going on. <laughs> no, please, please don't tell us what they said. I will tell, I will tell you what they said, at least, and then I'll tell you what I think is going on. Um, one senator said on, on the Senate floor that the classroom censorship law, the, the 2021 law, not, not these bills we're seeing now in 2023, 2024, was designed, quote, to ensure that the minds of the future generations of our state are not being unduly influenced by advocacy for such toxins as critical race theory. Commissioner of Education published an op-ed in June 2021 in which he attacked, quote, those who promote critical race theory or similar concepts and claimed that the classroom censorship law was important and needed to prevent concepts like those in Dr. Ibrahim Kendi's 2019 book, how to be an anti-racist for being taught in schools. That's what they said mm -hmm. publicly. Mm -hmm. I think the ambiguity is the point. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That they know that, you know, I you know, I don't have a quote to prove this, but I I feel very strongly that that is really what's going on. Why do I feel that way? Because it's not just educators think this is unclear and uncertain. Educators have asked, hey, I read your op-ed you know, citing these books, uh, Department of Education. Can you like confirm, is this covered or not? Because I don't want to lose my job. They will not get a straight answer mm -hmm. one way or the other. So that to me is evidence 
that the ambiguity is the point and they won't clarify it in the context of specific texts. And that is exactly where this law needs clarifying. Imagine being a teacher, you're trying to figure out what am I gonna teach this semester? What am I gonna assign? What, what articles, what books, what classroom, how am I gonna structure classroom destruction, in, instruction? Concrete problems that you're confronted as an educator. And you wanna know, gosh, if I sign this, we're, you know, we're four, four years removed from George Floyd's uh, murder. So Memorial Day 2024, I want to read one of these books. Can I, Department of Education? Is it covered? It will not get an answer. Now, I deposed a lot of people from the Department of Education in this lawsuit, and I couldn't get an answer. So I can't only imagine if you're an educator, just how, how frustrating that must be. So that's a long-winded answer, but I think to me, that is really what's going on and underlying. Can I just ask one more piece of cake? Of course. Isn't it really about that they don't want people to know the history of this country? Because if people know the history of this country, they might better understand racism. They might better understand all of the isms, and that would be dangerous yeah. to the people who are in power, which are basically people who you know look like me. Yeah. They're 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 someone who basically that's what it is. Because once you know, yep. as a friend says, once the toothpaste is out of the tube, you can't put it back in. So they want yep. to keep the toothpaste in the tube. Yep. But yeah, I I think what this is really about is. Now there is language in the statute that says you can talk about the historical existence of ideas and concepts. We gotta we gotta be clear that is what the statute says. But I think the fundamental problem with that is the linkage of those concepts to today, mm -hmm. right? So you could talk about Martin Luther King, you know, it's civil rights protests in the 1960s. So you're blue in the face. You're not gonna have a problem under this law. But where you may have a problem is when you link it to today. Hey, did the civil rights movement achieve its objectives in 2024? What do you think about those quotes? from Martin Luther King about white people. Do those resonate today, just like they resonated in 1967? It's that nexus that we need to properly educate our students that is being targeted under this law. I wanna weave in one of the questions from the chat. You've answered actually some of the things that have come up in some of these questions. So you're all on the same page, which is nice. <laughs> Um, but there was a question also, Jill, about the aftermath, you know, this case that you're currently working on, no matter how it's decided, you know, where things might go from here, you know, if the court rules in your favor versus not. So what should people kind of be expecting, depending where the decision lands? I think it's important that we win and that this law gets struck down. But one of the things that my clients have reminded me in this case, it's their name on this lawsuit. Mm -hmm. It's not mine. They're the ones fighting. Mm -hmm. It's not me is that the law is actually a win or lose, it's already achieved its purpose. Mm -hmm. We now have been living with this regime two and a half years, folks. Mm -hmm. It is gonna be very, even if we get an injunction, it is gonna be very hard to roll that back for educators to kind of retrain themselves to know that they can now talk about these things, to connect with their students. Mm -hmm. That's that's scary. So I don't, you know, litigation is often not the magic bullet. In fact, on, on most issues, I actually don't think it's it's the magic bullet, but it is especially true here, even with victory. Um, I think um, we will have a lot of work to do to try to get us back to where we were. Um, you mentioned that you endeavor to build a kind of a case or a record by talking to educators about their response to this. I agree with you, a deliberately vague kind of law. Were you able to get anything substantive from them? I'm, I'm a, school, a local school board member, and I talk with teachers on a regular basis. And what I hear from them is exactly that uneasy kind of feeling like, I'm not sure I, I could get fired, will I be called out? Yeah. But were you able to hear anything else from teachers and educators about their reaction to this law? Yeah, and it's it, and it, we were very conscious throughout the case and even deciding when, whether to bring the case that we didn't want to just present evidence of chill that, that was kind of vague in and of itself. You know, gosh, I feel like I can't say this. We wanted to show concrete examples 
that a judge could easily understand, mm -hmm. that the public could easily understand mm -hmm. of, of self-censorship that was occurring, which is why I actually thought bringing these books is so important because this is like, this has really happened in the context of real texts. And I also want to flag that, listen, like you have to remember that in this environment, it's also very difficult for educators to speak out. Mm -hmm. They're putting a target on their back. Mm -hmm. If they say, this law is problematic. They, you know, I, I want to teach this book, but I can't. You know how hard that is to do? You know the attention that it draws to yourself as a te teacher? You just want to educate kids, right? That's why you got into this business. And this is why I think what the educators who are bringing this loss are doing is so commendable. Um, in my case, you know, I represent Christina Filiba and Andres Mejia, who said, we're going to take the hit here. We're going to put our names on this thing. We are going to advocate and try to fight for the demise of this legislation, recognizing that we're bringing attention on ourselves in the hopes that perhaps that will deflect some of the attention on other educators. You cannot imagine how real that is, though, for mm -hmm. folks. When you put your name on something like this in the cultural environment that we are in, it is, in my view, heroic. Um, and a privilege to stand side by side with them, but I think it's a reflection of the very difficult environment for educators right now who um, just want to teach, but but you know fear um, fear the backlash. There was a dissertation completed in 22 by a student at Plymouth State that looked at some of the chilling effects um, as it related to I think English instructions. I can definitely send you the name of the student. Who, We'll go with this question and we'll take oh, one from our sure, virtual chapter. Go ahead. Um, so uh, other than trying to repeal the ones that, that have been played for now, is there anything coming from the other side, like laying up protections to yeah. prevent something in the future? That's a great question. So incidentally, mm -hmm. there is a bill at the legislature right now to repeal the statute. Uh, I should have had the number handy. But it, what's cool about it, we might have been involved in drafting it. Um, <laughs> is it doesn't just repeal the statute. It has a sentence in there about how, and you can't be punished for talking about race, gender, sexual orientation, gender identity. Trying to like, you know, part of part of the problem here is like we've lost the narrative here. The narrative here is that a lot of this instruction is critical. It's needed for our students to get the very sense of belonging that they are entitled to. And so to actually have legislation out there that not only repeals this bad law that never should have been acted, but says, I hear you educators, and we hear your students who want this, that we are gonna put language in place that makes sure that you feel safe talking about it. Now, you know, I think that might be a challenge to, to pass it this session, potentially, but think that is one of the goals here is to reclaim um, the narrative here. Um, and I think our students are, are depending on us to do that. There's another question from our virtual audience. Um, this one's asking about new proposed legislation that would give Secretary Edelblue subpoena power that could be mm -hmm. used to bolster the quote divisive concepts law against teachers. Do you want to speak at all? Of course. That, that, that is one I, I don't think the ACLU has taken a position on, but I would encourage folks to uh, reach out to AFT and NEA New Hampshire who have, who have advocated um, in that space. Obviously, to the extent that subpoena power could be used in the context of investigating classroom censorship, this law, we would have profound concerns about that. Um, you know, that, that ver there have been various versions of that bill, some that are broad that would encompass banned concepts. There have been, you know, some efforts to narrow it. Um, and those are, that's advocacy that's being done um, by the teachers unions um, and the Department of Education to see if language can be be figured out. We have time for probably two more questions or so, so we're not in a rush. Go ahead. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for all your hard work. Uh, if you don't mind a personal question, since we have all of these students yeah. here, looking back on your uh, 10 plus years. So do you recommend these students think about being a lawyer, a teacher, a political activist, or please run for the legislature. <laughs> so all of those things, you know. Um, so I'm, I'm a lawyer and I love being a lawyer. Like 
I, I was I was like built for this. This is like my dream job, and I I just I, I love it. Um, and I would never discourage anyone from being a lawyer, ever. Uh, don't let the haters hate. Uh, <laughs> right. But you don't need to be a lawyer to make change. I want to be super, super clear about it. I think sometimes litigation like this gets the headlines and it's flashy. I actually don't think that's where most change is made. I think it's through mobilizing. I think it's through community, community organizing, community advocacy, harnessing all of our power collectively as community members. And in fact, I think this case is kind of evidence of how, how hard it is to make change in litigation because it is defensive, right? I am If I win this case, the best relief I'm getting is a judge saying, okay, that law just can't be enforced. But what litigation doesn't accomplish here is the proactive things that we all need to be doing as a society, which is not just repealing this law, but actively promoting this type of inclusive education. You, you are going to get that result, not from any judge. You're going to get that result through the legislature. So mobilize in front of our legislature, testify in front of our legislature, become a legislator. Um, I think that's where a lot of change is made. Um, and, you know, so it's organizing, it's policy advocacy, it's all those things. So do what you love. That's really that simple. Uh, we'll do Dottie and then Alex. I have a question. <clears throat> do you think Derek Bell, you, you, with his law students, at, law students underscore at, at Harvard, uh, when he would talk about critical race theory, would he agree that this kind of work that we're seeing now is uh, a function of critical race theory? See, I, I, don't, I don't really think so, right? He, like, he wouldn't say that that this system is trying to protect itself by creating laws to, that yeah. further defends racism. Yeah, I mean, and that's I think like th these are this is where I think this conflation has been so powerful by the Rufos of the world because like that's not what's happening in schools, right? Like no, no, the, the, you know? but I'm just saying. But, yeah. but but what the 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 state is trying to do yeah. uh, with with people in positions of power yeah. are basically <laughs> trying to create systems to support uh, racism, which is what yeah. like John Bracey said was a pathology. Yeah. yeah, anyway. And they're doing it by targeting yeah. even the phrases like systemic racism, yeah. right? You know, that that has kind of been used as one of the buzzwords for like that's critical race theory. And the bias has been around by social psychologists, what, exactly. since the 1940s? Exactly, and that's directly under attack. I mean, it's it's gotten to the point where some proponents of this law have been very explicit, like anything related to DEI yeah. is yeah. covered. Yeah. Think about that, folks, how dangerous that is. Like anything related to DEI, in inclusion, what? I mean, come on, that, but that's, that's where some of these folks um, are going. Mm -hmm. Alex. Um, if I could uh, refer back to my earlier mm -hmm. question, suppose uh, the powers, the educational powers in New Hampshire, very explicitly without ambiguity, <clears throat> decide that uh, K through 12 students should not be taught about extant racism in our society. They're too young to absorb it. And they make the decision that it can be taught only uh, grades 13 and above. So there's an explicit prohibition mm -hmm. against teaching about present day racism in our society mm -hmm. uh, to K through 12 students. Yeah. Um, you referred to the First Amendment, but I'm not sure that um, K through 12 students have uh, the First Amendment rights of um, of um, adults. Mm -hmm. uh, and there is a power someplace mm -hmm. in the state of Massachusetts to decide mm -hmm. what should be taught yep. at K. So what I'd like to ask you is, would there be a legal theory that would make such a law unconstitutional. Well, but right, isn't it? I, I just want before you answer, isn't it also the case? Because this is what I hear. Uh, that question might even be moot because what I hear legislators saying is, and possibly even the governor, there is no racism. You can't say that New Hampshire, I've heard people say this, you oh, can't yeah. say that New Hampshire was ever racist. It was never racist. So there's this weird kind of perverse twist to this, which would say you 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 can't teach K through 12 students about racism because there isn't any. 
but we can let kids suffer from it in the classroom. I'm just I'm not talking to you. <laughs> we can let little children be tormented by racism, but they're too young to learn about it. And that's a, a very curious. So who are we protecting? Yeah. I, I want to. I'm sorry. Oh, I was just. Mm -hmm. So I want to get to. It's it's a matter of whose rights we are talking about. Now, if we're talking about the rights of students, there is, as I said, a potential claim that there is a First Amendment right to education. Now, where those lines are, I'm not. I'm not going to pretend like I know necessarily. If we're talking about the First Amendment right of educators, one of the difficult questions there is. Well, wait a second, we're just regulating curricular employment-based speech of educators. There's oftentimes we, we don't think of that as First Amendment protected because you're working for your employer, right, in that instance. So these doctrines can be difficult to kind of, you know, sort through when, when trying to evaluate whether these types of laws are constitutional or unconstitutional. But I want to I want to kind of flag just one thing here with respect to the, the rights of students to have access to information. I would argue that that um, that there are there are concerns when that is viewpoint based, and there are potential First Amendment implications there. But if the information is edu if, if, if the restriction is based on education suitability, then there isn't necessarily a First Amendment right. The question is like what that line is, which is very difficult. Now, if you listen to the rhetoric from some of the people proposing HB 1419, saying that we need these books. You know, we need a process to take these books out. What what they are very they are very artfully using the term education suitability to try to insulate this from uh, First Amendment attacks. So just be mindful of the words that they're using. It is with purpose. All right, we are at one thirty. So, um, Jill, just one final question: sure. If anyone wants to learn more about, you know, where things go with this case, sure. related cases, where would you send people as a good resource for learning more on this topic? Um, so, we uh, have a website, um, uh, aclu-nh.org. Mejia uh, M uh, E J I A is uh, one of the plaintiffs. You could just search, throw that on our website, and you'll get everything about this case that you need. And um, also too, you can go on the websites of AFT New Hampshire and NEA New Hampshire will have, have tons of information. I think where you're more like, most likely to get an update, frankly, is through the newspaper after uh, a decision is issued, whichever way that decision goes. Um, I want to, I, I want to, can I close with one thing of real course. quick? Yeah. I'm reading, I want to read and close with an article from the Washington Blade, which is an LGBTQ plus uh, advocacy publication. A 15 year old transgender youth left his school, walked down the road to the overpass, climbed the six foot chain link fence installed by the Department of Education to prevent people from falling off the older bridge and leapt into eastbound traffic. These students need mm -hmm. education that relates and talks to them. That validates them in what they're experiencing. We all know being in school is hard, it's especially hard if you're part of a historically marginalized community and identity. We know that students from those communities subject, uh, suffer through higher rates of bullying, suicide, depression. There are real consequences when these students don't get the education that they need. And that's just one example. So let's stay vigilant. We have to defeat these laws and we need to pass better laws that allow for inclusive education. Thank you.